There we go. Okay, so my name's Tish. I work for Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust um, as an engagement officer for the Dynamic Genescapes Project. And um, I'm joined by Rachel Graham from, from uh, the North East Lincolnshire Count, uh, Council. And also um, we have Guy Mason from Natural England, who's also working as part of the Genescapes Project. So um, yeah, we're really excited to tell you today about Dynamic Genescapes because it's mega, it's ambitious, and it's key to restoring what is now the most threatened habitat in Europe for biodiversity loss. So a plan for this evening, um, I'm just going to give you a quick overview about the project to begin with. We'll then talk about why the project focuses on sand dunes specifically and not other different habitats such as woodlands or marshlands or, or other habitats. Um, and we'll also look at sand dune formations, so how sand dunes are formed and the different habitats that we might see in a healthy and an unhealthy sand dune system. We'll then go on to talk about habitat management happening in Lincolnshire and specifically at Key Thorpes. So the project, to sum it up in one sentence, it's a pretty mega project, so it's quite a challenge in itself. Um, its aim is to restore sand dunes for the benefit of people, wildlife and communities. Funders include the National Lottery Heritage Fund and the EU Life Programme. Fortunately, Brexit hasn't affected the funding, so we can still carry on as normal. So looking at this on a map, We've got nine key dune areas that includes 34 individual dune sites covering over 7,000 hectares of sub dune habitat. So a pretty mega area. Um, a majority of these sites are on the West Coast. So we've got partners down in Dorset, namely Studland Bay. We've got uh, Cornwall, Devon, uh, a cluster of dune sites in South Wales, North Wales, and then up in the Northwest. And on the other side of the country, we've got Lincolnshire. So Lincolnshire is, is pretty special. Obviously, I'm slightly biased, but it's of interest because we have a very different sand dune system here. Sand dunes here tend to be smaller and less wide. And that's because the prevailing winds in the UK generally come from a westerly direction. Easterly winds are less common. And as a result, the sand dunes here take longer to develop and therefore we get these differences. So it's quite interesting. Why sand dunes? Why does the project focus on restoring these habitats and not peatlands, marshlands, wetlands, grasslands, um, any other threatened or more famous habitats? Well, every five to six years, surveys are done of the major habitat types across Europe. And in the most recent survey, sand dunes were identified as the habitat that was most at risk from losing biodiversity. And that's kind of an interesting observation in itself because um, I don't think sand dunes have ever really had much limelight. They're sort of like that space, that forgotten wasteland on your walk from, from the car park to the beach. Whereas actually they're really important for a range of different uh, plants and animals, many of which are threatened. And the main problem is that sand dunes have become overstabilized. They've become trapped between the sea and encroaching farmland and development. They become smothered and fixed by um, invasive species and rank vegetation. So this is an example of clematis here that is smothering covering the sea buckthorn and as a result it kills off the buck sea buckthorn. And also rank vegetation, that's going to include your common grasses, um, nettles, thistles, the plants that grow with as well basically do very well in nitrogen rich soil. They grow very rigorously and, and they choke and outcompete the more desirable species and that causes several problems. So we're going to look first at an example of um, dune overstabilization in Wales, a site in Wales. So um, here's a picture from 1947, just uh, right after post-war. So we can see here um, that light colored patch is all bare sand, sort of three quarters of the image there is bare sand. Um, and if we compare that to a photo from the early 2000s, we can see that now it's become a lot more vegetated. The majority of that image is now green, um, and it, yeah, a lot of vegetation. And that little patch in the, in the top left corner here, that's actually an area where Plant Life, one of our partner um, organizations, did some experimental project work that led to the formation of the Dynamic Genescapes Project. So that was all about creating these areas of bare sand so we can create a little bit more dynamism, which will in turn benefit the habitat and the species that live there, which we'll go on to now. 
So ideally, sand dunes need to be naturally evolving and naturally dynamic in order to support a variety of different habitats and species, including many threatened species that depend on this bare moving sand for their survival. So for example, we've got the natterjack toads. Natterjacks are also known as the running toad and they're found in just a handful of locations across the UK. Um, I love this fact that they were actually discovered by Sir Joseph Banks here in Lincolnshire, which is quite a nice part of our heritage. But natterjacks need bare sand in order to build their burrows. That's where they hibernate throughout the winter, and that's where they'll sort of stay during the day to keep out of the sun. They also need areas of bare ground to run and catch their prey. So they don't catch their prey sort of, as you can imagine, cartoon style with a frog sticking their tongue out and <laughs> hopefully getting a fly. Um, these guys actually, they, they stalk and they run to catch their prey. And as a result, they need this bare ground. They also don't do so well in areas where there's trees or tall shrubs. And that's because the trees and shrubs can provide perches for their predators. And as you can imagine, natties are a tasty snack, so they don't do so well if there's lots of predator perches. Also on the right hand side here, we've got the sea aster mining bee. So this is an endangered UK priority species. And it also requires very specific habitat, namely sandy soils and sparse vegetation in order to build its nests and find enough food. So management interventions, they are necessary in order to restore and maintain these ecosystems. But in order to understand why, I wanna first consider how sand dune forms and what a healthy sand dune system might look like. So this might be a recap for some of you from um, GCSE or O-levels. Um, Basically, the process of sand dune formation is called succession, and it occurs when you get the right conditions of sand, wind, plants, and water. So, when first of all, you need these big low tides and these big areas of exposed beach. When you have this kind of environment, you get strong winds that will drive the sand up, lift it, and move it inland into the system. When this sand encounters an obstacle, so like debris, this could be man-made or biological, it builds up around the, around the obstacle and forms these little mounds. So <coughs> if this debris is biological, um, it, will, it will decompose, the biological matter will decompose. I do have a picture here. It will be decomposed, for instance, shells or horn rack or other, other types of seaweed. These will decompose and these release nutrients into the sand. They also help um, with water retention. And that creates the perfect conditions for these pioneer plants. So, for instance, sea holly or prickly saltwort that are specially adapted to withstand the harshest conditions. So these plants are amazing. They have to withstand like really high salt levels. Um, <coughs> high winds, frequent flooding, low nutrients, and also lack of fresh water. So the specially adapted surface, they have spines or small waxy leaves to reduce water transpiration, and all those kinds of things. So as they grow, they trap more sand, more sand is blown onto them, making the mounds larger. As they die, they release more nutrients into the substrate. Following this, we get marron grass falling in the order of succession. So mound grass is much better at getting buried by the sand. And as these little mounds grow, um, mound grass begins to take over because as mound grass is buried in the sand, this actually stimulates root growth, which in turn binds the soil and you get the formation of these embryo dunes. So it's between the sand line where all this debris might be deposited and the mobile dunes that we see the most dynamism in the dune system. As we move inland, um, the dunes become more fixed, the soil becomes richer, more stabilised, and we begin to see a different kind of plant community. So, for instance, we might see viper's bugloss or hawkweeds or hawkbits. We might see lots of different orchids, even yellow <coughs> rattle. Yellow rattle is a, a fantastic species um, because it's, a, it's a, a parasite of several grasses. Um, so, by keeping the population of grasses down, it allows space for other plants and wildflowers to grow. So then you end up with quite a species rich dune grassland. So we've talked about how wind is important, sand is important, um, plants are important, but what I haven't mentioned yet is the importance of water. What I mean specifically is groundwater. 
So looking at the diagram, we'll give you a kind of a good idea about this. In the winter, the water table is going to be fairly high. And where you've got these dips between the dunes, um, small water pools were going to form. And we call these areas the dune slacks. In the summer, when the water table is low, these slacks dry out. However, it's this seasonal variation uh, in, in the water level, in the water tables, and sort of the wetness and dryness of, of the dune slacks that is really vital for a number of species, for your natterjack toads, for your newts. And because a lot of these species are specially adapted to cope with these seasonal changes. In comparison, pools that are wet all year round are more likely to, to contain fish or common amphibians, which then outcompete the specialists. So what we really need is a water table that is just about to breach through the sand, creating these damp, wet or seasonal pools. This is an example of a little pool um, at, at Salt Kootenai. So in summary, um, a healthy sand dune system is going to contain a mosaic of different habitats. You're going to have these bare sand areas and mobile dunes with the early pioneer species. You're going to have species rich dune slacks supporting different mosses, plants, liverworts and, and vertebrates. And you're also going to have the fixed dunes where you find species rich dune grassland and hopefully uh, vegetation and scrub with a varied age structure. In an unhealthy dune, on the other hand, you're going to have less bare sand. You're going to have um, invasive species, perhaps, such as that clematis, and also the rank vegetation, such as common grasses, nettles, and thistles. Um, and the, as a result, the dune system is going to be more stabilized. Rank vegetation can occur as a result of nitrogen deposition. So that might be from, for instance, industry, air pollution, fertilizer runoff, neighboring farms, even dog poos. I don't know if this is something you've noticed walking down a public footpath or through a nature reserve. Along the sides of the paths, uh, you'll see a lot more of these nettles, thistles, rank vegetation, even if it's in an area where you'd expect to see wildflowers and orchids. And that's because the dog poo actually changes the chemistry of the soil, um, meaning that these nitrogen-loving species outcompete uh, the, the wildflowers and orchids, for example. Invasive species can enter a sand dune system, either through people's collections, for instance, the seeds might get caught on the wind and let themselves make their way onto the nature reserve, or through garden waste. You'd be amazed at how many people think, still think it's okay to dump their garden rubbish on, on a nature reserve. Um, oh, it's all biodegradable. No, it doesn't really work that way. <laughs> but anyway, um, unfortunately, no matter how beautiful clematis or rosa rugosa looks but when, when they're flowering, unfortunately, these species tend to smother and dominate the nature due to species. So it's important that we manage these. But as a result of these things, our sand dune habitats are shrinking and we're losing connectivity between them. This connectivity is really vital for animal migration, especially in terms of building resilience in a changing climate and changing ecosystem. So that's where Dunescapes comes in. It's all about reintroducing dynamism into these systems and restoring them for wildlife and basically safeguarding them for, safeguarding them for the future. So the project area in Lincolnshire, um, it covers six, about 60 kilometres of coastline, all the way from the Humber to the Wash. So that includes Cleethorpe, Dunnanook, Saltfleet, and Thettlethorpe, uh, Gibraltar Point National Nature Reserves, all of which are recognised for their conservation importance. Most of the habitat works are actually taking place at Saltfleet Bee. And uh, you might have noticed over the last few months that we've been doing quite a lot of landscaping work and really changing the profile uh, down by RIMAC. So part of that includes turf stripping, which is basically removing that top layer of soil to create bare ground. And that's really important um, for a lot of species. Also, it helps create dune slack habitat in the freshwater marsh. So yeah, supporting those pioneer plants and animals that need bare sand. Um, and that's all quite exciting. And as well as that, um, yeah, it'll support plants, mosses, liverworts, the jack toad, um, the dune, tiger beetle, and also the two millimetre narrow mouthed well snail, which is quite a mouthful. Sorry, the crucifix ground beetle here down on, on the uh, far left. So yeah, <coughs> lots of really interesting plants and animals. Also back in January, February last year, uh, this year <laughs> actually, um, we removed 3.6 hectares of clematis and dead buckthorn. Not an easy task by any means. Um, 
So basically, the advantage of this is it will allow recolonization of species rich dune grassland, which is really fantastic. It's also going to help maintain um, the health of the vegetation. So where you've got vegetation that's become stagnant and overgrown, it's removing those. So you end up uh, allowing more sunlight into the system and young plants to grow. As a result, you get this varied age structure of the vegetation. You get young plants, medium aged plants and, and, and old plants, and that supports a much greater biodiversity. It supports many more like invertebrates and vertebrates. And this is kind of similar to what we want to achieve at Cleethorpes. And Rachel and Guy will touch on this in a little bit. But what I really want to stress is that we're not destroying this habitat. Um, as many of you know, the maritime forests along the Lincolnshire coast, uh, these areas of sea buckthorn, they are important uh, for, for many breeding migratory birds um, in providing a food source for migratory birds. Instead, what we're doing is managing these habitats and managing the scrub for the best outcome for biodiversity, using techniques that are grounded in science, informed by evidence, and specific to the wildlife and habitats found on the site. So here we have a couple of maps that show you where the habitat management is taking place. I'm actually going to hand over now to, to Guy and Rachel, if you're happy to explain those, because it does look quite confusing, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, uh, especially, I'm a, I'm a fan of the narrow mouth well snail. Two millimetre little guy. Amazing. Um, so yes, these maps, just to get some context then, uh, you've got uh, the map on the left. Uh, the top left of that map, you can see the Leisure Centre car park. So the Leisure Centre is just off, um, off the side of that. Uh, and then if you head down to the bottom right of the map on the right, um, you'll see a little cafe uh, right down the bottom there. Um, and that that kind of gives you a, a rough inc uh, inclination of where that, that might be. But you've obviously got the boating lake there as well to give you some kind of context. So um, uh, essentially what we're doing here then is, well, a continuation basically from um, a 20, uh, a 20 year management plan, really. It's a, a, a rotational coppice. Uh, the last time uh, this happened was in 2014. So we get them in roughly five year intervals. Um, and to achieve conservation management and favorable condition targets, these features, uh, we need to at least um, try and take out the, in, in this case, two hectares um, of sea buckthorn, uh, which will put back um, age, structure, height, and uh, rejuvenation through retention, removal, and coppicing. So it's age structure that we're trying to basically put back here. Uh, so the red locations that you can see there are the elements that we'll be taking, followed by green, which is um, the line that we'll be leaving, followed by red, followed by lean, uh, uh, green. So it's a, it's a take one, leave one, take one, leave one. Um, again, eventually this is, all, all this is designed to do really is to put back more biodiversity in what is essentially a very, um, uh, oh, what's the word? Uh, basically a, a uniform, a uniform kind of scrub block. So we're trying to put back that, uh, that structure uh, and future-proof it basically. Um, the only addition to this that you can't see on it is that the embankment, which is that thick red line, um, is obviously managed uh, via uh, Northeast Links, uh, uh, via the council, sorry, via Rachel's team. And this is in partnership with the Environment Agency. So that line alone will be down to ground level and will remain there for its sea defences and its, um, uh, its need to provide that uh, system. So the rest of the uh, contract there and the rest of the red lines that you can see will very much be a case of uh, coppicing. Uh, Rachel, did you wanna add anything to that? Uh, just to say that there's part of the Humber Estuary SAC, it's a requirement to manage the buckthorn and the fixed dunes for, to restore the grassland. And this is part of that management as well. Um, yeah, and the, the flood bank, is, it runs along the length of marine walk. Um, and as I say, we've got to keep that clear so that the, it can be inspected for its integrity as its use as a flood defense. So, I think um, 
I mean, I've got notes here of 2014 or the last time this happened. Is that about right? The last uh, scrub removal, Rachel? Yeah, more or less. We do oh, do um, we do do smaller bits in between, but the major assessment to keep you know the the different age is roughly every five years. Yeah. And that area was in the top left hand corner of the map, essentially, wasn't it? So um, uh, we're talking that uh, the space there without the majority of um, our our colour, obviously, because it's all uh, pretty much done and dusted. And again, this, this happened in 2014. And um, rather fantastically, um, after uh, a couple of years and after some lovely mess, which nature absolutely loves, uh, we got some fantastic species there. Um, specifically the orchids. We've well, uh, got a picture so, of that if you want. Yeah, yeah, go, go for it. Back. Is it this one? This is might be one of them. Yeah, that is one of them. Uh, so that was in that was in 2019. Uh, they've spread even further than that now. Uh, and we've uh, then this year, and well, they were there th last year, but this year we've definitely had uh, four different types of orchids. So we've got southern moss, which are in the picture, uh, common spotted hybrids. Uh, the bee orchid and pyramidal, uh, all in the all, all in that area that was done in um, 2014. So yeah, it turned out really well. <laughs> Fantastic. It certainly has. Uh, 